Greetings and welcome to this lecture video regarding material science and this chapter is on diffusion. When it comes to diffusion there are a number of different factors that we need to consider. First off, how does diffusion occur and why is it important? Why is it an important part of processing as well? Processing using diffusion can affect the properties and therefore the performance of uh, the materials that are involved. Now can we predict the rate for maybe some just some simple cases and how does that diffusion depend on the structure that we are diffusing through as well as the material that is doing the diffusing and also what's the effect of temperature. This particular video is only going to introduce the concepts and I have a number of future videos that go into greater depth in the calculations and characterizations of different types of diffusion. But we always have to ask this question, why? So we have a question that we will answer in this chapter and that question is why was aluminum but not copper used for many years in computer chips, integrated circuits if you will. The start of the answer is this. Even though copper is a much better conductor and therefore it's going to run a lot cooler, aluminum diffuses much less easily into silicon. That is an issue and we will answer why it's an issue later on. So what is diffusion here? Diffusion is the mass transport by atomic motion. Now it can happen in solids and liquids uh, and gases, but it's just uh, atomic or molecular motion moving back and forth. So that's atoms moving within other atoms and around other atoms. There are different mechanisms for gases and liquids than there are for solids. Gases and liquids use what's called random or Brownian motion throughout because there's plenty of space for a gas to move around or a liquid to go back and forth. So there's plenty of spaces in, uh, in fluids here, but not so many spaces in solids. Solids have to have uh, spaces made for them. Now, you might have vacancies or you might have interstitial in diffusion with solids. So it's more difficult, but it does happen. So in solids, there's something called self-diffusion. You actually have the atoms of a solid moving around within the solid. So if you think about this as maybe some carbon and you labeled some atoms, over time they would actually move. So A has moved over here, D has moved over here, B hasn't moved very far, and C has moved over here. So again, th this isn't all that exciting, but it does happen. How does it happen? Well, they don't just move like this. They have to have vacancies, as discussed in the previous chapter, that exist. And you could look at it as the vacancies move, but it's actually the atoms moving and the vacancy shifting from one place to the next. Interdiffusion happens when you have an alloy and if you have certain regions of high concentration in an alloy those atoms will move to regions of low concentration and it's similar to the interdiffusion of a single material but in this case you have two different materials that will eventually begin to mix. So we start with a full concentration, 100% say copper here and 100% aluminum here. And you'll see that here. And then over time, you will see that it still might be 100% copper well on one side and 100% aluminum well on the other side. But then in between, you might have kind of a mix. So right here, it's maybe 50-50. So again, we need spaces in the solids. So one way of doing that is with vacancies. That is how interdiffusion or self-diffusion works by vacancies opening up and then an atom moving into the vacancy 
and leaving another vacancy. Another atom moves there, leaving another vacancy, and then another atom moves there. So over time, they may begin to mix. So the atoms exchange positions with the vacancies, and this applies to self-diffusion with its own, but also with substitutional impurity atoms. Now I'm going to emphasize substitutional because not all atoms can substitute for another one, but that was a subject from chapter 5 about what can and cannot count as a substitutional impurity atom based on the Hume-Rothery rules. Now how fast does this happen? Like we said, we you show increased elapsed time, but this time can go from seconds or fractions of a second all the way to millions or billions of years. So it is highly dependent on uh, a few factors here. And this rate depends on the number of vacancies. And again, we calculated vacancy numbers in the previous chapter, and that's highly dependent on temperature and how much energy it takes for one of these atoms to jump into another space and from this atom to jump into another space. So we need temperature and that temperature is going to drive these to uh, move into these spaces. Now I have a diffusion simulation that I'm going to run and this is about interdiffusion across an interface. Now we're going to assume that on one side we have copper, again on the other side aluminum because they are completely soluble in one another and this is what it's going to look like before and it's going to look something like this after and it's a random thing so uh, the simulation you see is going to end up somewhat different than this but you can see that we still have a bulk on the left here of copper and a bulk of pure aluminum on the right and in between we have a, a mixture of atoms. And again this rate of substitutional diffusion depends on how many vacancies there are and what the frequency of jumping is. This is not a, a particularly scientific simulation, but it will give you an idea of how this happens. So here's our simulated copper sample on the left and aluminum on the right. And you can see that these, not every one is moving every time only some of them, I think I have it set at 10%, that indicates that some of these spaces here are vacancies and some of them aren't. And sometimes it has enough energy and sometimes it doesn't. So at, over time the random motion allows for a concentration of the copper to increase in the aluminum and decrease in the copper. So more aluminum would come this way, more copper would go this way. And again, that's over a period of time. This goes through about a hundred cycles and should end up with more aluminum to the left than started and more copper to the right than started. And there it is. So we end up with a little extra copper here, just mainly aluminum here and in the last two columns and we still had plenty of copper in the bulk over here but in the middle we had more copper here more aluminum here more aluminum here and a little bit more copper so and uh, you, you'll find these entire columns full of aluminum for whatever reason but it still made uh, a little bit of aluminum all the way to the third column here and some copper all the way to the third last column here. Now another way that diffusion can occur is the call, something called interstitial diffusion. Now as we discussed in the previous chapter, interstitial impurities are smaller atoms that can go in between larger atoms. So diffusion is the way in which these smaller atoms move. 
So if you have a small interstitial atom between these other larger atoms, it can bop over to another space. Now what's really, really important about this is that it is more rapid than vacancy diffusion. And the big question is why? So remember vacancy diffusion and what is required for it. And then look at what's going on here with interstitial diffusion and think about that. Why do smaller atoms have an easier time of it? Why is it more rapid than vacancy diffusion? So if you're waiting for the answer, here it is. Because there are plenty of spaces where these interstitial atoms can diffuse into. Now it's quite unusual for all the spaces to be filled or even a majority of those spaces to be filled so there is almost always a place for it to go whereas in vacancy diffusion these large atoms that were part of the main lattice have to wait for a spot even if they have enough energy they have to wait for a vacancy before they can move So a great example of how we can actually use diffusion is something called case hardening. It's where we diffuse some carbon atoms into iron. So obviously a steel or some kind of raw iron situation, but these carbon atoms go into the host iron just at the surface. And these carbon atoms are much smaller than the iron atoms, so they can go into these interstitial spaces. So we can actually control it and move it. place these carbon atoms right along the surface of this gear. Now this gear may need to be able to withstand shock or stress or a, a variety of other uh, environments and the carbon at the very edge here may not be appropriate for what's going on in the bulk. It makes this edge very hard and very uh, brittle, but also very able to withstand a lot of the contact stresses, and it is very hard. So that's why we would only want to put it into the surface rather than to the rest of the bulk, because then the entire gear might be made very brittle. So this will allow it to last much longer than just the uh, common bulk material that's in here to begin with. So it makes the uh, iron, which now becomes steel with the carbon, much harder and wears much longer. Another process that uses diffusion is something called doping of silicon. This is how our integrated circuits are made and give you a hint towards the answer of our why question that began our lecture here. So what we do is we dope silicon and that's simply putting material down and letting it diffuse and the, we dope it with phosphorus for these certain types of semiconductors and our process is as follows we put in a phosphorus rich layer on the surface of the silicon so just little bits on the surface now this is like a cross section so you actually are seeing a cross section of paths and then we heat it so if we keep it relatively cool here there won't be much diffusion at all but then you just raise the temperature up a little bit and that phosphorus goes right into the silicon making these uh, high phosphorus regions that's part of what makes them become semiconductors looking at this image we have just the computer chip itself but showing appropriate contrast we can see the silicon atoms and then here we see aluminum atoms that are placed down in a similar fashion as the phosphorus but these are probably connecting the different transistors from one to the next. Now we can quantify this rate of diffusion because if you're going to be laying down a specific amount of phosphorus 
into silicon and you only want it to go a certain distance you need to heat it and you need to do it for only a period of time how do we make that happen it has to be clearly designed so we need to quantify that amount of diffusion and we can do that using this flux flux is the amount of mass diffusing over a certain amount of area during a certain amount of time so it might be in moles so that would be the number of atoms over a particular area times time or if you're looking for mass it might be kilograms or grams or milligrams per square meter second this is done empirically so they just do experiments and figure out how it works they make a thin film and they know the cross-sectional area they put a particular concentration on the one side and then they see how fast the atoms get to the other side so to calculate this they might have a the mass over the area times time but it would be the derivative of mass over time with respect to area and have a some constant there to finish it off so this is what it might look like if you graphed the mass diffused over time so initially it's going to be relatively low it's going to be practically nothing and then on the other side of the membrane you'll start seeing a very specific slope and that is related to J linearly so that is the introduction to diffusion the next video will pick up where we left off uh, with something called steady state diffusion and go into more details on how it gets calculated I hope this helped and thank you for watching